Future of Entrepreneurship Music Driven Business Panel. Um, the discussion is of course brought to you by the J and the Hive, so shout out to them for giving us the space. My name is Helen and I have been a music journalist for the last 10 years and I'm going to be your facilitator for today. Um, today we're discussing a topic that's obviously extra important in this country with our high unemployment rate. So if you can get your own business going, obviously that's what you want to be doing. Our objective with our time today is to give you the basics of how you can get into and sustain yourself as an entrepreneur in the music industry. So, uh, I'm going to introduce our very cool panelists. <laughs> we have um, over to my far left uh, Tom Nguna, who is the founder or co founder of Raw X Studio and Productions, and he co founded that with his brother PH. Uh, Tom is the creative director and project man manager at Raw X. That's Tom, everyone. <laughs> um, we also have Vanessa in the middle over there, Vanessa Tegi, who is originally from Lesotho but has lived in Cape Town as well as in Johannesburg, which is where she's based now. Um, she is the public relations events coordinator and creative producer at Cool Out Concepts. And then to my left, we have Ninel Masson, who is a business developer, a chartered marketer, and talent manager at The Fifth Season, which she co-founded. Um, but she prefers the title of User Experience Master. So before we begin, just a couple of things. Um, the hashtag, if you're gonna be tweeting and all that lovely stuff, is hashtag FOE, the future of entrepreneurship. Um, and then our Twitter handle is at Hive Joburg. Um, by now, I think you know where the toilets are, but if you don't, they're upstairs and to the left. And as usual, please keep your phones on silent, even though we do want you tweeting and talking nice things about us. <laughs> so, um, because I only got one room, I feel like I need a little bit more, right? So I want to know who is in the room, and the panelists want to know who is in the room. So if this applies to you, can I get a whoop whoop? Can we just try it out so that we know everyone knows how to do it? Can I get a whoop whoop? Yay! So, who here actually owns a business? Okay, great. So, who is an artist manager? <laughs> Alright, so who is an event promoter? Artist. Okay, so you basically want to know how you can get on these people's books. That's why you're here. No, no. Why are you here? Basically, want to know how we can do what they do ourselves. Ah, they want to cut you out of the equation. Cause like, it's a mission. Come on. Mission. Okay, I hear you. We're gonna try. There's too many of us and not enough of them. Okay, we're gonna try and get all of your questions answered today. So. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're super excited to have you here. Nanelle, I have to start with you. <laughs> the fifth season, right, is a music-driven business and an independent record company. Um, and obviously that is home to people like Berita and Trezor as well. Um, and you're a user experience master. So tell us a little bit about the business and what it is that you do. Uh, the pop season, yes, you're right. It's a it's a music driven business. Uh, it's an entertainment agency. If you you have to describe the whole group, the pop season is an entertainment agency with music at its core. So part of it is an independent record label. Uh, the second part of it is for the talent, which is then the 360 degree uh, management services that go to uh, artists that were signed, as well as the other entertainment talent, so non-recording talent as well. And then the other side of it would be um, experiential, so we have to create a lot of below the line activities for all the talent that we work with, own shows um, and events. So uh, Tom, your company, right, uh, Raw X, has either produced or engineered or had something to do with award-winning albums like um, Lost in Time by Kulichana, as well as Skanda Republic by K.O. and AKA's Alter Ego. So um, your role over there 
What exactly does it entail? So what Royal Studios is essentially is a production hub, a creative hub for music. Um, and what we've done over the years is we've been able to uh, partner up with different acts, such as the guys that you mentioned before, yeah. um, uh, notably Kuli Chana, uh, aka KO. And what we do is uh, we, we offer the um, we offer the, the, the facilities to record your own your whole project to engineer it, and we also offer the, the, the production as as per piece, but it's not limited to that or restricted to any or, or restricted to anything. Sorry. So um, with, with those projects you mentioned before, all we did was uh, uh, some of them we do, some of them were engineered, but Roy Studios just uh, creates a, a platform for people to come through and do the music to the best of their quality, and we help them distribute it elsewhere. So we let them own their music, uh, distribute it how they want to. So it's not a traditional record label, it's just a creative hub. But what exactly do you do then? What, what I do, um, I'm the project ma manager, creative director. So with like a pro production house, if you were to only be um, focusing on selling beats or getting studio uh, or selling studio time, you would limit your potential as a company to make money because there's so many other avenues. So what I do, I could, oh damn. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so what I do um, around the music, I find different concepts in which we can explore to make money. And one of them is why we are partnered with, with The Hive, being uh, We Make Better Music Than You, a pop-up academy. So um, along with my team, we conceptualize an idea that we've, Rowing Studios has been in existence for 10 years. So we've been working with a lot of different artists. So we thought being the 10th year would be a great time to give back to producers specifically. So what I did and what in my role was to help uh, conceptualize the idea, find a way for it to come alive, that's finding sponsorship and different avenues to, to, to pull it through. And after we've done that, uh, I step into my second role as a project manager to actually manage the project that I help conceptualize with my team. Uh, Vanessa, Cool Art Concepts was already established by the time that you joined, right? But you were already, um, you had your own PR company, you were working with people like Naima McLean as well but you've added all these other roles to Cool Out. So tell me about what it is that you do. My partners consist of DJ ID, who is a Keo, and he's the creative director. We've got Reason, he is the consultant, sort of creative consultant. We've got DJ Speedster, he's also a music consultant, and P. Kara, who's a DJ, and then myself. So what I do, I handle the branding. I'm actually at Vega doing my honors in um, brand innovation and strategy. Um, and I also handle the production, creative production. So that, what that means is basically we have a status meeting weekly. We sit there, we have cool out parties, we have festivals, we have all sorts of touch points that we do. We also manage artists such as Naima and Judicial and etc. Um, and I do, what we do is we come up with ideas and it's Vanessa's job to make sure they happen. And then that's the best way of putting it. So everyone's like, we should do this, we should do that, we should do that, and Vanessa sits there puts in her input and then we call Jägermeister, we call the partners, we call everyone to make it happen. How did you then, like practically, how did you then move from the bedroom producers to actually now, 10 years later? When we moved from a bedroom to a garage, we're still in a garage right now. <laughs> <laughs> the garage is a little bit more fancy now, we've got equipment and stuff. But the point of that is that you can do, um, especially music, you can do it anywhere. And, our next step from like next year, our plan is to record more outside of the studio, like hotel rooms and wherever we go, essentially, because you just need your equipment and you just need your ideas. So what we did to, to kind of um, elevate ourselves from bedroom producers, um, at first is, is, is the, there's nothing that I can point out that we did knowingly that we're gonna now become professional, but it was just the most important thing that we that's helped low X over the years is aligning ourselves with different people with similar um, tastes and similar objectives. Because when, my, let's say my brother, PH, when he was doing uh, Alter Ego, Alter Ego and Top Originator and Lost in Time, um, none of those artists were big artists. It was just somebody like PH trying to get a song out. And he was a producer trying to get a beat out. And, um, meet, meeting, meet, meeting and working with people with, with similar um, drive and, and goals is very important. That, 
that's how we kind of transcended because the people we worked with ended up becoming big artists. Uh, AKA became uh, AKA Kulichana became Kulichana, and us maintaining those networks and relationships and being able to keep working with them allows us to grow with them just because we associate associated with them. So I'll say definitely the most important thing for Roy Studios was networks and maintaining the networks and being able to deliver when we had the opportunity. So that's what's kept our, our name growing. And just like you mentioned, what Alter Ego uh, is kind of Republic and Lost in Time, that's the most recent of those projects was 2014. But because of like good quality delivery and uh, being able to associate us with them, we still relevant for that, even though we've done a lot more stuff up until then, which we'll speak about later. All right, uh, back to you, Nana. Um, because Fifth, the fifth season started as the fifth season audio, right? So you started off with the music. How did you identify the gap that you wanted to fill? Um, our, our, our mission is, is once we created the, the, the product, my job, my mandate is to create demand for our talent. So every single day, if I'm not doing activities or things towards that, that's it, that's my main focus. And we started out in entertainment generally. So I was always, I had a thread of promoting events and doing events. Um, my partner, Rafael Benza, had a background in doing concerts, entertainment, and especially international shows coming into South Africa. So that was actually our, our thing. Um, and then we started realizing that everything that we do, all of these platforms that we create, and that we manage now to sell to brands, to sponsors, entertainment at the same time that. And so how can we make sure that that talent is coming in-house or we, we have some ownership on what's happening there? Because essentially we could be putting a DJ out to an event or putting an artist at the MTV or a campaign, um, but then we don't actually oversee any of the other parts of these business or brand, right? So that's how the record level got formed. I mean, the record level sort of started with, um, you know, Benz and AKA met uh, before, you know, just after Entity seven years ago. Um, and it wasn't, um, an appetite from a lot of the major labels at that time to produce and put out a, a long hip hop album, especially uh, in English. Um, so that's how that, that business actually started. When you started, did you have to have a nine to five to kind of invest in your dream? I'll answer that. Um, last, I think, I just, I, I, I was working like last year, last year, June, July is when I like left my job. Um, I was working for Monster Energy as a music consultant. So it was kind of similar, like in the same field that I'm doing now. Um, and I needed that, I needed the networks that I got from there. And I needed obviously the capital to keep putting into the music. There's a lot of things that don't reward immediately, especially with music. It's a lot of, it's, you gotta stay focused on the bigger picture. A lot of different parts go to the bigger picture. So you don't get paid immediately. So for me personally, I needed some kind of income to do what I was doing because I wasn't the type of person to be reliant on other people um, giving in money for me to do things for them. So I was more like, okay, get in your own money. And my brother the same, he was also making money in the, in like farm row X because he was handling the, the sessions directly. Uh, he's the engineer, I'm not the engineer. So yeah, definitely for me, I needed to get other income to put into the business. And even now that we're making some kind of money, our plans to make more money is not directly from how we just made the money. It's things outside the line with the music as opposed to just selling a song or album. Uh, in my situation, I've never worked a nine to five. Um, I just worked every job that I was that I had the opportunity to have. So I'd be the door girl. I would assist someone on social media. I would work an event. Basically, you just don't say no. I'll intern. I will. I will be in my bonnet in someone's stall. You have to make income. But the problem with the nine to five is it sets you back because then you're not doing the product what you need to do. And people who you're even better than. Uh, then they're sort of going forward and making more than you in terms of the sort of social capital. So I could never risk that. And the nice thing about picking up these sort of jobs is that I still have control over my time. I can say yes, I'm coming, or no, I'm not. Whereas with the nine to five, now the biggest opportunity of your career comes, and you can't because you're in a contract. So I definitely, I'm glad I didn't do a nine to five. It was tough. You know, it also it comes with, then obviously I'm on taxis, I have to, two minute noodle situation, you know, we can swag it out, but it's hard, but you definitely have to, it's a 
balance what it is that matters the most. Is it about living a good life in Joburg or is it about making your dreams come true? Yeah, I have to agree. I think it's, um, it's for me, I mean, my background is actually quite corporate before the first season and even in between. And I just always did multiple things at the same time while this business was growing. Until it got to a point where it was impossible for me to do what else I was doing to bring an impact. Like, it was really a push. It was like, there were a couple of snags, still continued, still continued. And then it got to a point where it was impossible to do anything else but the first season right now. And I think for the artists as well, it's quite important to be able to know that you have to, you know, especially those starting out, their first year, like, you, you, even if you've got a song out on radio, even if you've got a couple of shows here and there, you're going to do so much uh, promotion of yourself, you're going to need so much to be invested in your music or whatever it is that you're creating, that you have to have um, a couple other things to sustain you so that you, you follow the right path, you know, you don't cash in too soon because somebody offers you something and now you've got to do it because you, you can't pay bills. Um, I think it's a, it's a little bit easier, I think, if you do obviously have a team or you can sign, like, I mean, um, if they are, you know, pay for the production of music, for example, is the job of, of the record label, if you're signed to come season or whatever it is that you're working with. But until that point, do as many other things. And you'd actually be surprised how sometimes these things can all come together. So you end up working in fashion or do graphic design or something like that, just to pay the bills, but your dream is to make, you know, that album. Um, and then you, you could find yourself doing designs for, for, for another artist that becomes a part of your network or you could do your own work um, instead of having to pay for somebody else to create you know, single artwork or whatever the case is. So yeah, I would definitely recommend it. Not the 9 to 5, even if it's a 2 to 5 or if it's a 12 to 3 a.m. Um, yeah. So just find something that you can do in the meantime. So um, because this is not like just any other panel discussion, I'm going to be reaching out to you guys and saying, do you have any questions? I mean, we're going to talk a little bit more about being an entrepreneur in this industry. But in terms of what we just covered right now, is there anything that's unclear or a question that you have for the panelists? OK, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Polani, uh, but everyone else knows me as Wax. Um, I'm also an entrepreneur. I run a creative and digital agency that is now focusing in music. So my question is um, to everyone on the panel: How do you make money? Like, what's the revenue model? Because at the end of the day, we're selling music, and music is everywhere. Everyone listens to music. Lawyers, while well, they're making money, they're making music, right? But at that point in time, they're not paid for it. So that's what I'm trying to solve as a business. But from you guys' work, how do you make money? in the music space, because chances are you're selling someone else's music. So where is that income sharing um, space between you and the people's music? You need to have multiple streams of income as an individual and as a company. So if you look at Cool Out, each of us as individuals have multiple streams of income. So Reason's got his rapping, Akio has got his DJ, I've got my PR and everything. So already now when we get to Cool Out, we're covered. That's the best thing because you don't want to be relying on your company or your passion to pay your bills because then you get desperate to make weird decisions and all of that. Once you're done, you're like, okay, I'm feeding myself, now let's make cool up, make money. We start with events. We're going to have a party at Kitchener's um, and we're going to charge 50 rand at the door. The income that comes from the door is what we're going to make our money from. But bear in mind, we have to pay the DJs and we have to pay the venue. That's why. Why are we paying venue? Why are we paying in the bar? It's making so much money. Scratch that. Let's get our own venue. So we get our own venue, the Cool Out Rooftop. So now people are coming and booking. So Uncle Frankie, Twins on Deck, all of them are booking the venue and then we get that from them. We have our own party, so we're scratching the venue fee away and we get our own bar, which is where actually the money is as opposed to a venue. So now we're not, we haven't even touched on the music, but we're in that industry in terms of making money. Then on top of that, because we're a team, my man has booked the venue. Oh wait, you're gonna book in order to get the venue you're gonna get speedster, DJ, you're gonna get reason, I'm getting the ten percent from that, everyone's eating from that. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The Yeager Meister comes on board, now we wanna do huge festivals. Now the best thing that we've discovered now is do make your money before anyone has walked through the door sponsors. So now that's when you talk and you get the proposals, that's when your digital um, knowledge and your graphic design and all of that comes into contact. You make sure Jägermeister is on board, play, Red Bull, whoever it is you're working with, you speak to them. This is our concept. They pay for everything. So by the time the first person walks through the door, you're making a profit. That's how you make your money. That, that's how we're making our money. I'll take one more question for this section. Anybody else got a question? Okay, so we're going to move on then. Um, Tom, you were speaking about networking earlier, right? 
And I know some people are musicians, but they are shy. Or they're musicians and they think they're too dope to be networking. What are the practical ways to start networking and gain a database or a contact list? When we started, obviously, it was hanging around in the places where like-minded people are. Um, in 2017, it's, it's, it's way easier. You've got social media and you've got like-minded people on your phone. And um, that, that's how we network now. Like, a lot of opportunities I found were like maybe Instagram ads or something. I found out about the hype on Instagram, the spots and posts, just to, just to show that like, um, everything's on social media. I can't emphasize how, how important that is. And um, it's just about being able to target what you do and find that in, in in the environment and now the environment is not necessarily being on the street or a party or anything that is a form of networking but everything all the work has been posted on, on, online it's just something like um this, this academy we do it we find all our talents through through them sending what they do to our email address and even if we didn't have to do that if we we're looking for producers we could still do that go on soundcloud or whatever so the most important thing is, is aligning yourself with like-minded people online that, that's that's important don't just follow people who don't do anything for you i keep cutting down the, i keep changing who i follow based on what i'm trying to achieve all the time and like so the content that i i see on my timeline it's, it's not it's not just for like seeing a, a funny facebook joke it's, it's sometimes it's super important especially because we spend so much time on social media those jokes are funny <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so you just gotta min minimize them a little bit Maybe like one in five the other four things must make you money the other thing makes you laugh <laughs> okay got it got it uh, vanessa um cooling in the city is your flagship event right but you also do events all around south africa so what would you say are some key insights that you can share about music in the different regions that you operate in it's really important to not overestimate your wealth or who you are, who your artists are, but also don't underestimate yourself. So if you go to a place like Volcom, for example, there are people there who have heard of Reason, some, some aren't really into that, they're more into house. So when he gets there, it's, a, it's, it's, it's sort of like he's starting afresh. His performance needs to be dope, people are probably hearing it for the first time. So also I've got uh, people who are unknown who are, who are managed. And I take them there to Valkov and it's the same thing. It's about when you get there, are you gonna perform? Um, the networking the network in Joburg is basically a macro version of the mini versions in Bobo, in Brief and Chain and everything. So you've got promoters, you've got artists, you've got venue owners, and all of those people want the same thing that people in Joburg want. The venue owner wants people at his venue, the promoter wants to have a party with them and try and play as little possible for the artists and make money. So I think the most important thing for us and the way we sort of spread around is connecting with promoters across the country. Yeah. So, because we can't, go in there by ourselves is, no matter how big our names are, we're going to have 10 people there. Connecting with a promoter who's doing stuff already allows us then to tap onto them and have a mutual benefit, like beneficial relationship. So, I feel like everything in the music industry is about collaboration. Anyone who's claimed to make it and hasn't collaborated is lying. You need more people. Need more people. <laughs> uh, Tom, your We Make Better Music Than You Academy. How can these artists get onto it? If, if you guys are a producer, a beat maker, composer, you guys can um, email like three, three original compositions to info at phox.com. Um, you can also follow the hive for more details and the submissions close on the 19th of June. So if you're a rapper or a singer-ish, <laughs> you might want to just follow the project and see yeah. who made the... We figured, the that, we figured that there's already idols and there's already the hustle. Um, <laughs> had to show love for the guys in the bedroom really making the, the, like, the beats and stuff. Because nobody sees them and like, they make the song. So this is kind of for that. Yeah, bedrooms and garages. <laughs> All right, cool. In terms of what we just covered right now, is there anything that's unclear or a question that you have for the panelists? So, quite interesting here, because I mean, when you talk about events and, and promotion, with regards to, I, I really want to, I tour a lot. So, usually, how I raise the funding is, is I apply for it, I write the proposals and, and, and get to, the, and, and get to the, the venues. But I want to expand my reach, and also, maybe it's also genre specific. I'm sure maybe to, if you're talking about reason, um, he comes there with his DJ pack or, or whatever, I, I come there with, with five packs. 
and already on the first day it's costing me about 12,000 just to transport them. And actually when I make when I make the profit, I don't even make a profit at the door. It's just maybe if I see five people, I'm happy. But the quality of music is always is always good. So how do I get um, so if, you, if if let's say I'm asking a question from from the point of, a, of an instrumentalist and a, and, a, and a musician from a point of view to say how do I connect with the promoters and what's the best way? Because I mean there's also little uh, information. I mean there's little scope or, or, or little um, networks of promoters of managers and obviously when, like especially you have to work hard at, at, at like getting the attention of people. So how do as an independent how do I go about uh, making linkages with, with promoters, um, with, with venues, and also creating a, a larger scope for, for audience reach. Now, my advice to you would be like there's this app, I don't know if you've heard of the Jägermeister Cartel. So, that is a beautiful way to do it. Because of the promoter, I want you there, but I can't afford you because you're 12k and you're competing against a DJ who's 2k. And I'm, I'm gonna go with him. Whereas Jägermeister, what they've done is they've got a band and they endorse them. So they get paid by Jägermeister and they spread the name by going around different parties and building their sort of, so we know they're attached to the Jägermeister brand, but we also know they're a cartel all on their own. So I'd advise you to get a brand that's willing to be in that space of music to, to work with you, and then it's not so much, so, so much pressure on the promoter. So if you come to me and say, actually, I'll travel and everything is cost, just pay us exactly what you paid the, that other rapper, you're on. How you network with come to the parties? Because me getting an email from someone I don't know and I've never heard about is like, there are people who are here every single Sunday jumping on the open mic who are asking to come on board and I'm much rather gonna give them a chance than I'm going to give someone I've just, I've never heard of. So come to the party, say, whose party is it? I promise you go up to them, this is a perfect spot to talk to them. Especially in our city, we're not very much north where, you know, we're in the VIP, there's no VIP, there's nothing, we're sitting right there. Come talk to us, this is what I do. I'm gonna remember you. Email comes in, and I'm like, oh, it's that guy. Facebook like, like him on Instagram. Okay, I see you, I see you, I see you. That's how you sort of build the relationship. It's like how you, how do you make friends with the friends that you do make? You saw them, and also if we like the same things, it's interesting to talk about it. So I think have a personal relationship because then I'm gonna back that more than just someone that just wants to come on board and that's all. So it's a personal relationship, get a brand to lower your costs and just be dope as well. Find a way to do it for free as much as you can in order to spread the spread. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I just wanted to add, because I think, um, especially in hip hop, the expectation from a promoter back in, you know, a while ago used to be, it's just a backdrop and you're just in the light, you're in a booth in the club or whatever. And I think a lot of artists have pushed boundaries now to do the live band thing for every single performance. Um, and I think that's a part of also just pushing the boundaries with promoters and the agents because that's what the, what's actually a better experience, a better, a better quality music experience for the audience and the crowd that's there. And I think that's sort of happening right now. So I mean, it's just it's going to keep happening and it's going to keep growing and hopefully that makes it easier uh, for bands and live bands as well. And I think this idea of, you know, when it comes to sponsorship from brands, these brands are wanting to do big money, put on these big shows and own the whole thing and have all sorts of brand things, the cost of lights and the big stadiums and stuff. But then there's also brands that don't have that much budget, but they want to participate in music. And so they're okay with having a little bit of branding on stage at whatever gig you're playing at. And it's like, it's like, like you said, it's 12,000 rand to cover your band costs. So the, the brand, like a, a smaller brand, they, they can give you 12,000, 20,000 for some flights and whatever equipment. Equipment companies also do that, the music stores. Sometimes they want you to play with your kit and then they do extra branding so that it's visible to everybody that's watching you perform on stage. So it's a little bit of a hustle, but it's not such a big, you know, you don't need 100,000. You need those smaller amounts that can keep you going and it's out there. And this part is about the challenges that you've all faced as entrepreneurs in this music industry. And Nanal, um, for you, AKA was one of the big artists on your platform, right? And he went and dissed you guys on uh, Twitter. And obviously, um, as a brand, that must knock you a little bit. So what lessons can you share that you learned from that experience and how did you bounce back? Um. So remember when I said earlier, my mandate every single day is to create popularity and demand for the talent, right? So that means that what we've been doing and pushing the brand of the talent into the spotlight, that's what we've sort of been doing. We've never had, yeah, we have a social media profile website. 
But our job and what we spend all of our resources on is to build the following, the popularity, the exposure, the media, the PR of that talent. And I think I still believe in that. I don't think I've changed my view on that since, you know, over the last few years. Um, the company, the fifth season takes a back seat. We don't need to be known by the fans. We need to be known by the rest of the industry that we need to do business with. So the other record labels, um, the media industry, um, there's a very different set of stakeholders that are important to the brand of the record label or the company behind the scenes. Because that's what we are. We operate behind the scenes and not in the forefront. That's what the talent needs to do. So, in a sense, um, I mean, I think even when the incident when you're talking about the tweets and stuff a couple of months ago, um, that actually increased both followings. By, like, I, that's probably one of the first things that I did to go and check and that. Um, but it doesn't affect our um, reputation with the people that are in our business behind the scenes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, the fans, who are the fans not of the fifth season, but the fans of the artist, are still the fans of the artist and are still going to buy that music and are still going to demand that product, which is my purpose, right? Yeah, totally gets you. Gotcha. <laughs> And I mean, now you have um, branched out and you have actresses and comedians on your books. Yes, so this year we, we uh, have, uh, yeah, this was a decision a long time in the making, but we have decided to um, expand our relationship with non recording music, non recording just general entertainment talent. So, comedians, on the air, radio, TV talent, um, sort of been wanting us to, to work with them for a long time, uh, but now became a good time to. Gotcha. That was sort of always in the plan, but yeah, yeah. our core is still always going to be music. Cool. So don't go out and diss your managers on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it might not work as well for you. <laughs> so Vanessa... Yeah, sometimes controversy is not a bad thing for your music profile. Yeah. All right. So Vanessa, um, with your particular brand, Cool Out, um, there was an unfortunate incident where someone died during your event, right? A young man called Slam. So tell us how you as an entrepreneur with your partners actually bounced back from that. It was, it was really tough, because uh, just to give everybody context, so we have, what happened was, it was Reason's birthday party, and it was a cooling in the city, and man, it was a crazy night, hey, like, Pearl Tissy was hosting, the lineup was Questa, AKA was even on there, it was Reason, it was just anybody you can imagine on that lineup. And at some point, the party was like, we'd move, because it was winter, it was this time, we'd move downstairs, so it was like an underground party, the energy was high level, and like, the crew we looked around and were like, yeah, this is it guys, we're about to like, just go to the next level. And even though the people who have been with us coming to our party since we were just like Kitcheners, we're just on a high, and one of those people was Slam, the Dimo. And he's been with us, he lived, he lived in the Val, and he would travel all the way to come to a cool out party. He would be there at like 2 p.m. when the doors open. And that, that energy, I can understand it because I promise you, it was like, guys, we're finally making it, we're leaving the underground and we're making it commercial, you know? And everyone was excited and he had gone to the bathrooms on top of the rooftop and he was drunk because all of us had been drinking. And we have their stairs coming down and just for fun and games. He wanted to, you know, as we're kids, we slide down the rail. And he did that and he was drunk and he slid down the rail, got to the bottom, lost his balance and fell down about 12 flights of stairs to his death. So what happened is I'm backstage, um, just you know, jamming it out, and kind of comes to me in a space. It's just he's like, Vanessa, come, you need to check this out now. And I run and I look down. And it's like someone's died. I look down and I see the body, and everything changes in that moment. What happens is immediately I don't even know what what happens. You go into another phase. You run. You call the police. Whatever, whatever. But in your mind, you're not thinking how is this affecting our brand. You're just thinking, oh my gosh, someone came to enjoy us and ended up dying. That's all. That's all. You come to a cool out and you might not live. You might not see the next day. So that was what was killing us. After we all get it sorted, you know, we we all went down to the funeral. We helped with the funeral costs. We um, partnered up with his brother, we built and raised some funds for the family, we do parties in the Val because of him. And but the most painful thing is if you Google at the time last year, if you Googled Panisatsiki, you would find 
all the major publications, so it's the Sunday Times Times, not saying best events coordinator or PR extraordinaire, it was like kid dies at party. So that was really, that was a hit on all of our personal brand. If you Googled Reason's name, if you Googled Akio's name, because these are high profile brands. And what we did was we just, what else are you gonna do but be yourself and do what you were raised to do and that's just act right and be right and keep moving on. And we did that, we made sure, if this was our brother, if this was our cousin, how would we want the promoters to act in that? We went the extra mile, we pushed, and we moved on and we're honest in all our interviews, like this is what happened. And yes, next time we didn't even imagine that could happen. Now the security is standing right there. If you even dare touch the banister at a Kudan party, you're actually going to get kicked out in that sense. But it hit. It was a setback. But one of the things that Q and I love to say is everyone loves a comeback story. And we went downhill from then because then a lot of our market is from the bar as well because they're hip hop heads, head to for some reason. And they stopped coming because that was a bit of a thing for them. And it was winter, Reason was knocked down, we were knocked down, you know, we're coming into work at like 12. So it went down, I was making like 900 a month. And then we came up again and we fought and we fought and we started making events and we, and something just turned and tipped and then we, st we were number one again.